Hello, and welcome to Ideas Having Sex with Chris Kaufman. I'm Chris Kaufman, and each show I bring to you an interesting and provocative scholar to discuss topics in social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you enjoy what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Ideas Having Sex. I'm Chris Kaufman, and today I am joined by professor of law at Georgetown University, John Hasnas, and we are talking about his new book, Common Law Liberalism, A New Theory of the Libertarian Society. John, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. I loved this book, and to some extent feel like I've been waiting for someone to write this book, or at least a book like this. Libertarians are always interested in the common law or at least like i feel like i'm aware of some of the background and history of the common law because it's of interest to some subset of libertarians but i feel like it doesn't get the attention that i want it to it seems like a really important topic i think there's a fairly standard strategy in the libertarian playbook where people will claim that the government is necessary to do all kinds of critically important things and that they would never get done without the government. And libertarians will either, one, argue that the thing is not good in the first place, so shouldn't be done, like maybe the war on drugs, or that the market can actually handle it better than people think, that people widely underestimate how creative and dynamic the market is at solving human problems, and that the government is not needed to do it. And there's X, Y, and Z historical examples of the market providing lighthouses or whatever it is. Or, And I think you take a similar approach here, but instead of talking about about primarily like economics and the market, you talk about the common law as providing a lot of important social goals without the need of centralized legislative efforts. Sorry to talk so much right at the beginning, but do you think that's a fair account of part of the book? Yeah, thank you for the summary of the thesis of the book. Essentially, the thesis is that a lot of things that people believe has to be done by government can be done and is actually done by the common law. The book's not directed towards libertarians as much as anybody who takes a certain either economic or social contract approach to political theory. When we're supposed to try to be insightful and write interesting, sophisticated things in books, but I never think that my writing is like that. I just think I'm noticing things that seem obvious and other people are overlooking. And I think it's because of the political science slash economic approach to when government should act, and it's markets have negative externalities, governments have to step in and internalize the negative externalities, and that's why you need government regulation. And that approach simply leaves out the fact that the common law is a regulatory mechanism. So it's just overlooking something that I think is obvious. It could be that I have this attitude because I managed to go through college without taking any economics. So I didn't hear about this kind of market failure argument before. I went to law school, and then when I got out and I accepted a job at Georgetown in its business school, I heard people talking about market failure all the time, market failure, market failure. That's when you don't get the optimal results from market forces, and so you have to have government regulation step in. And the examples they always use were examples that, to my mind, just coming out of law school, were cases in which the common law or lawsuits had addressed the problem already. And it made me believe that the dominant sort of public policy approach to issues is aligned to something that's very obvious. So I try not to talk too long, but in the book, I mentioned the invisible gorilla experiment. So this is a psychological experiment that was done where the subjects were asked to count the number of basketball passes done by two teams. Some had black shirts, some had white shirts, they're moving all around. And your, the job of the subjects was to count the passes of the basketball for each team. And while this is going on, a woman dressed in a gorilla suit comes walking into the frame, stands there for a second, looks at the camera, and then looks at walks out. And after this was all over, and they asked the subjects about the gorilla, 50% of them didn't know there was a gorilla. They didn't see it was the gorilla. And they didn't believe it until the video was replayed. And that's supposed to exemplify some a psychological phenomenon called inattentional blindness. You don't see, you can get so focused on what you're doing that you don't see other things that are really obvious. So that's sort of my model 
for what I'm doing in the book. I'm saying that political theorists, whether libertarian or other types, are focused on a particular model, which is this market value model. Markets don't give the social optimum. There are negative externalities. Government has to step in to regulate the externalities. And in doing this, they're so focused on the model, they can't see something that's right in front of them due to inattentional blindness. And that's the fact that the common law is a powerful, in fact, it's the most powerful regulatory device that we have in our society. So I always think that I'm not saying anything very clever. I'm just pointing out something that's obvious. And I can never figure out why everybody else doesn't just see it. There are definitely prominent legal scholars in the libertarian tradition, but maybe it's just more swarming with economists, so it doesn't come up quite as much. I grew up in the libertarian tradition, and I read a lot of what's called anarcho-capitalist writings. That's an explanation of how competitive forces in the markets will provide all services, and you don't need any coercive regulation. I've never bought that myself because... I didn't learn economics until after law school. And in your first year of law school, you take court law. And you see that there's a powerful safety regulatory device that not only exists, but has existed for uh, hundreds of years that keeps us safe and that makes us cooperate rather than fight with other people. It's built into the system. And I'm not an anarcho-capitalist because I don't believe that the market is the realm of unregulated voluntary transactions. I think the market is the realm of interactions that people have or transactions between people that's regulated by our ethical beliefs, by customary practices, and by the common law. And that's a lot of powerful regulation. If that all failed, if that failed and there were some dangerous things that were taking place that couldn't be controlled through those forces, you might have an argument to say the government should step in and regulate. But it's really hard to find examples of things that aren't successfully regulated by ethics, customary practices, and the common law. Now, I tend to be an anarchist, but you can go a long way towards a libertarian way of thinking or a libertarian society just by seeing how much safety regulation and other kinds of important regulation the common law provides without the government doing anything. You said... If those things failed, then you might have a case for government action. And I think the might's important because you would still need to show that the government didn't fail worse or that the danger of having government try to address something isn't a bigger problem. Some problems are worth living with. and Not every problem is solvable, at least in the short term. I appreciate your comment. The word might is key. But if there are negative externalities that are not internalized by ethics, custom, and the common law, then you might have a case for government regulation. You might, but to tell whether you do or not requires a comparative assessment. You're entirely correct. The comparative assessment is, what would it be like if we have government try to address this compared to what would it be like if we don't? And there might be something that's less than socially optimal, but if you empower the government to fix it, you'll make things much worse. Creating the power doesn't guarantee that the government will function Effectively, every time you try to correct things or fix problems through government action, you run into all of the host of problems that the public choice economists talk about. There's a possibility for rent seeking. There's a possibility for special interests to capture the regulatory mechanism. There are political incentives that will take it away from the optimal result. Those are all real problems. So you might have an argument for government regulation, but you have to show that the world without any regulation is worse than the world with real world government regulation with all of its dangers and all of its rent-seeking possibilities. I tend to think there aren't many times in which you can make that case successfully, but I'm always willing to be proved wrong. I think there's a PR coup that has happened just because the word market failure is the prominent choice of term to kind of like lump all of these problems together. I don't know if they're completely identical terms, but I prefer the term collective action problem because I think it captures more generally what the issue is and collective action problems happen in and out of markets, in and out of government. They're not unique to markets. I think 
David Friedman has his own definition of these kinds of things where individual rationality doesn't lead to group rationality, where everyone correctly following their own interests somehow leads to an outcome that is worse for the group as a whole. And his point is often that that's actually the norm in government and the exception in markets, though it can happen anywhere. I entirely agree with that, but to tell a story on myself, I'm not an economist. When I first started writing about things and tried to use economic terminology, this is many years ago, I gave a paper and Peter Betti pulled me aside and said, no, 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 here's what, what the terms really mean. So I've been instructed that internalizing negative externalities is one example of a market failure. There are many market failures to collect their collective action problems. Here in the business school, we teach about collective action problems all the time. There are all of these imperfections or ways in which things can go wrong that can be characterized in different ways. So I tend to stay away from the characterization. The point I'm trying to make is there is a powerful regulatory device that exists and works all the time. And if we ignore it, we ignore it at our peril. I mean, think about it. If you're an airline, what are you more afraid of if you cut corners for safety, a $100,000 fine from the FAA or a billion dollar judgment from a plane crash. The large judgments that you hear about are much greater financial incentives than any regulatory fine that comes about through government regulatory agencies. Many years ago, I worked at a large environment and the company was creating an environmental excellence program. This was going to be the company of environmental excellence program to show how committed it was and <clears throat> ran federal pipelines. And $80 million of the program was for paperwork. I asked, why is it all paperwork? And the answer is because if we don't fill out the paperwork correctly, that's an offense, an environmental offense. And if you violated the regulation, anything goes wrong, now you're an environmental criminal. So you have to spend all of your money needing regulations that don't actually solve the problem. They would have rather spent the money in, in making sure the pipelines went, ran well. We had a symposium here many years ago. It was a company called Computer Associates. It basically made software. It was in a scandal. It was convicted of fraud. They had the compliance. They, part of the penalty was they had to have a monitor their behavior. And the compliance officer is here speaking and he says, I have to spend millions of dollars on disk manufacturer, but we're a software company. The fact that we make disks is completely irrelevant. Yeah, so now we make disks safely, but it's all money that's wasted, which could have been better spent somewhere else. The thing about common law regulation is the standard is you have to use the amount of care a reasonable person or a reasonable company would use to guarantee the safety of others. It doesn't tell you how to do it. It tells you how to use reasonable care. You can create safety mechanisms in the most cost-efficient way for your company. And as long as you're using reasonable care, you don't have to worry about being fined. You don't have to spend millions of dollars on paperwork or filling out forms or making sure that you are crossing every T and dotting every I so that when you're not accused of a violation of a federal regulatory offense, which will then get you in trouble later on. So before we get more deeply into some of these issues, can we backtrack a little bit? Can you say a little bit about what the common law is? What is like the specific historical thing that we call the capital CL common law? And then what more broadly are you talking about as like an ideal type? That's a really tough question. Here's why it's a tough question. I'd have to guard myself. You have to ask me to talk about the history of the common law. I'll become really boring. I'll start talking about ancient, ancient Anglo-Saxon times and the Norman conquest and how the court, the common law courts evolved. I'll go off on tangents, the historical development of English and therefore American law is fascinating. The question is, can I give you a useful quick synopsis without digressing too much? The answer is that in the past, there was not centralized government authority. The interesting thing about England is England was controlled by the Romans until the fifth century. The Romans were responsible for the enforcement services, for all of the governmental services, for the law, for everything. And they just left. The fifth century, they left 
because the general at the time decided he wanted to go become emperor. Suddenly, the Roman forces left, and the people were left without government. And so it's an interesting historical experiment. What happened? Well, what happens, of course, is people need things that will make them secure. So at first, there are negotiations, there are settlements. It's sort of a process by which, by trial and error, by which people find out what rules will allow them to live together peacefully. And as time goes by, it becomes no longer negotiations, rules evolve. And finally, at some point, you have customary law that people understand are the rules that allow them to cooperate. So England in the past was governed by customary law that had evolved from trial and error cases and people learning what creates cooperation. The Normans being great administrators, they managed to co-opt the customary law and offer the customary law in the Norman courts. So the common law courts were the courts provided by the King of England. And the King, to collect money from providing the service of the judicial service, but the king didn't make the rule, didn't make the law. The law was the customary law decided in the king's courts, and that became the common law. So the common law is the law that comes out of the royal courts over the course of centuries, which started out as customary law. The other half of our law is statutory. Like the king could make eight edicts, he could pass that, parliament could pass statutes. Today, Congress and state legislatures create, but that's all fairly recent. The law that got our society going, so the war law, which is about personal security and preventing injuries, that evolved through common law processes. Property law, which that evolved mostly through common law processes. Contract law came from ecclesiastical courts and was incorporated into the common law. Commercial law was incorporated into the common law. And these are simply rules that evolve by cases being decided and when a lot of cases are decided in such a way that they provide the ability for people to cooperate the rules become stable so i told you i would digress and go too, uh, too far in one direction but i'll illustrate it this way when i started teaching law school one of the basic courses that the students take is a course in a legal process how does the law work i remember in this first year casebook they're trying to illustrate the common law process. And they have an example of a rule, a judicial decision in Kentucky, which is really stupid. It's a rule that the courts came up with. It doesn't work very well. And because it doesn't work well, there's more and more litigation. Meanwhile, a similar case comes up in Tennessee. The Tennessee courts say, oh, Kentucky solved it in the following way. And look, it's not working. We're not going to do that. Tennessee picks a different rule. Then it comes up in North Carolina. North Carolina can look at Tennessee and Kentucky and see it's working in one, it's not working in the other. And it uses the Tennessee rule. 20 years later, when all the states have learned don't do what Kentucky's done, a similar case comes up and then the Kentucky court overrules its rule and adopts the more effective rule from the other states. Common law is a trial and error learning process. If you pick a rule, if you happen upon a rule, that allows people to cooperate effectively, then the litigation load goes down. There are not a lot of cases testing the rule and it becomes stable. When I teach torts, the first case in the casebook is from 1308. It's a battery or an assault case. Another one from 17 something. These rules are ancient and stable because they work well. If you pick a rule and you happen upon a rule that doesn't allow people to cooperate effectively, then there's more and more litigation is repeated. Litigation load goes up. And the added litigation allows courts to try different rules. And eventually, you happen upon a better one. So rules that don't work create more litigation and get tested more often and can wash out. Rules that work become stable over time and become the rules of law. And that's where we got our tort law and our contract law at also, that's where we got our criminal law from. It's testing rules of cooperation over time and letting the foolish ones wash out and the successful ones survive. Hey, everybody. This is Chris Kaufman, and I just wanted to take a minute to thank everybody so much for listening to my show. This has really been a dream come true for me to be able to speak with scholars that I admire and read books every week that I'm always excited to read. This is still a small show, still a new show, still growing, 
and I appreciate everyone listening so much. If you want to help me grow my show, the simplest thing you can do is to write a review, just a short review, a sentence or two on Apple Podcasts, or just recommend it to a friend. So I'm just reaching out to you to beg you humbly on my knees to please do that. I'm going to try not to bug you too much about it, but here I am bugging you. Anyway, back to the show. You mentioned earlier the commercial law that was adopted into the common law. Is it fair to say that like the commercial law, which evolved in the commercial courts, the mer- law merchant, the Lex Mercatoria, that this is itself an analogous form of customary law evolving, but just in a different area of Europe with different people. And over time, they evolved with the same feedback mechanisms of trying to reduce disputes, encourage cooperation. So they settle on commercial rules that help cooperation, especially international cooperation. And at some point, you've got this beautiful set of rules that's very time tested. And the common law courts of England say, why not just use this? Was it the king who incorporated it? Or is it just that judges start saying these rules are applicable and they're very useful and they work over here? So let's start using them in England. Is that kind of how it happened? Yeah, your description is very accurate. The common law I was describing, like tort, property, contract, that evolved within the British system. The interesting thing about commercial law is, as you just pointed out, it evolved across Europe in the law merchant, which was the kind of rules that would allow merchants to settle disputes and travel and provide a surety that they wouldn't be exploited in different places. So its own customary law evolved through the law merchant. What happened was, in England, I'm going to get the time period wrong, but Lord Mansfield recognized the value of the law merchant, and he intentionally incorporated the law merchant into the common law as the commercial law. So he had recognized a good product, and he adapted it into the common law. That's not always the case. Contract law, by the way, was similar. Contract law evolved in the ecclesiastical courts, and then it was drafted into the common law. There's many, many different courts, many, many different fora in the past. What happens is over time, more and more of the customary law becomes incorporated or engrafted into the common law, which is the law that comes out of the royal courts. There are four royal courts in England, and it absorbs more and more of the customary law. But your explanation for commercial law is entirely accurate. It wasn't the king. It was Lord Mansfield who recognized a good product and said, okay, this will be the law in our system as well. The interesting thing is, no smart people figured this out. There was no guiding intelligence that made these rules. We learned that the rules worked by looking at them and seeing which ones work and the trial and error process. So Mansfield could see that a long trial and error process had produced a really effective set of commercial rules. So he said, let's just take it. That's a lot more time saving and labor saving than having to develop it yourself. But it is still recognizing the value of the customary law and incorporating it into the legal system. And this is very similar to competitive markets and technical innovation too. And sometimes you have one lone genius who comes up with an amazing idea, but more often than not, it's a lot of tinkering around the edges. It's smart people improving something a little bit and the successful innovations sticking around because people like them and they work. Yeah, I entirely agree. In this respect, I consider myself a Hayaki. What I mean by that is human beings just don't have, have the ability to amass enough knowledge to run markets or to know what proper rules of law are. We have to learn from experience, from trial and error. We have to experiment, see what works. I'm not sure that this story is accurate, but as I understand it, the guy who made Domino's Pizza just said, here's an idea, and he became a millionaire as a result. It's not like there was some college-educated people planning out what was going to be the best way to make a lot of money. If 100 people try something and 99 fail and one person succeeds, then we know what works and then people can copy it. That's the way markets work economically. That's also the way the common law works to produce rules. So there is a parallel between the way markets work and the way common law develops. And I am I reacting in the sense that I think this is the only way we can succeed because none of us can possibly know what rules of law will work under different conditions. The thing about the common law is that at any point in time, it's always wrong. There's always some ways in which it's not 
certain you know, giving the optimal result. And that's good because that's how we learn what has to be changed. In 1990, one of the big problems in the torque system was what was called junk science in the car. Peter Huber wrote a book on it. There was all of this junk science that was going to destroy technological progress. And it's the way the common law is functioning improperly. And it was constant agitation for tort reform from the government to solve this. But the convenient thing was in 1992, government became split. Like the Republicans took over Congress and the Democrats had the presidency. And the reason why the 1990s was great is because the federal government was basically gridlocked for a long time. So the Democrats who wanted tort reform couldn't get it through. By the year 2000, nobody hears about junk science in the courtroom anymore. And why? Because cases have worked their way through the system. They have actually gone up to the Supreme Court. And a decision called Kumo Tyre and Dalbert had developed guidelines for what the standards are for the getting scientific evidence into the courtroom. And those were good results and they're stable. Now we don't argue about the same thing because the system is self corrected If the government wasn't paralyzed and Democrats had been able to say, let's tort reform in the following way, I don't know how much damage it would have done. But it wouldn't have been the best result because we have to learn through experience and through trial and error what the rules are that will work for us. You can't take people from Harvard Law School and say, make the rules. They just don't have the ability to attain the knowledge of all these various factors that's required to do so. They can't make these specific rules, but you point out that nevertheless, you can state the broad principles behind the rules pretty succinctly, even if the specifics have to be ironed out through trial and error in a lot of complicated ways. That is my position. I shouldn't give any of this away. (laughs) I just have to hope that none of your listeners end up in my torts class, okay? I teach tort law at Georgetown. I love it. It's a great course. We do an entire semester of developing the rules. We start with intentional torts like assault and battery, imprisonment. We do negligence. We do strict liability. And we slowly but surely develop all the rules and see how they fit together. And at the end, it's supposed to be a neat packet. So the very last slide that I put up at the end of the course says tort law in four sentences. And tort law in four sentences is don't intentionally do something that will injure others. If you do something that might injure others, be careful. If you do something that might injure others and you can't protect by being careful, then you got to pay anybody who is injured. And the fourth rule is, if you don't like any of these rules, you can change it by contract. That's actually the entire course in torts summed up in four sentences. So you can abstract general principles from the rules themselves, but I can put the course into four sentences because the cases came first. I'm a, intellectual summarizing or abstracting after the fact. That's what law professors do. There's tons of cases, there's all these decisions. We look at them, we say, how do these all hang together? And then we think we're very clever when we come up with these principles in the background. Inspired by your book, I've been interested in the common law for a long time. I got torts in a nutshell. And they open up talking about how difficult it is to define what torts even are and how little agreement there are and saying, you know, what the general principles behind them are or something like that. But I like the way you phrase it. Okay, so since you said it, you have to make sure that no person who's going to be in my law school class sees this. Turn off the press. Because you're doing Fast forward 30 seconds if you're going to take Mr. Hasness's course. You're doing exactly the right thing. The nutshells, they're a wonderful title. Tort law in a nutshell, contract law in a nutshell. They boil things down to... created a study aids for students who are going to take the first year exam. But the quickest way of getting the feeling for what the areas of law is is by reading a nutshell. I refer to it all the time. The reason why I don't want my law students to know this is because they'll just skip the course and they'll read the nutshell. (laughs) So I'm trying to think, like, what is the major difference between what happened in England with the common law and what happened in, in other societies? Do you think it's accurate to say that the king of England or the state you know, they came in and tried to partially nationalize the courts, but not nationalize the the actual rules, that they more or less still let the individual dispute resolution systems that were happening locally, the folk moots and whatever, 
but they wanted to make sure that they had one hand in the pie of like selecting who the judges are. And, but other than that, they let the rules kind of evolve mostly on their own. I'm going to give you my opinion on this. The central governments are not made up of intellectuals trying to find out what ideal justice is. They're made up of people who are interested in absorbing as much wealth as they possibly can. So we had the England had a customary law that was functioning to some extent in Anglo-Saxon times. The Normans conquered England with feature about and this is just a long way of saying the common law of England, which is also the law of the British Commonwealth family of countries, is a historical accident. There's nothing that and it had to come out this way. It's just an historical accident. There was the customary law in England, the Normans conquered England. The Normans had no interest in governing the English. They were Norman French. They just wanted as much wealth as they could. William the Conqueror is famous for saying he's not going to interfere with the customs of the country. He didn't care how people lived as long as he got the revenue that he wanted. So he didn't come in and try to overlay some kind of new legal system. They just went with what was already there. That was the customary law. It changed, of course, over time because the Normans became the dominant group and they wanted to make sure that they could always exploit the Anglo-Saxons to some extent. So there's a difference between the Norman, French, and the others. That's where we get the story of Robin Hood from. But the Normans had no interest in providing and providing order for the people. They just went with what was there. So the customary law from Anglo-Saxon times continued right into Norman times. The king, Norman kings, their only interest was in getting revenue. The court systems was a way of getting revenue originally by offering ways of settling certain disputes in royal courts. The king could collect a fee. Over time, more and more of the disputes ended up in the royal courts for historically coincidental reasons, the royal courts offered a better product. I have, I think the story of this is completely fascinating, but it would be entirely too boring for your audience. I don't want to start talking about ordeals and trial by congregation and why the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 made a difference, and that's why the royal courts became popular. Just obviously take my word for it that the, at some point the royal courts started providing a better dispute resolution mechanism than the other alternatives. And that's why the customary law became the common law of England. I, I do think it's it's super interesting, and I'm probably in over my head right now in trying to do my own reading to dive into this history because it's a lot. And it's okay. So if you're like me, you're like me, and you find this interesting. There's fantastic books to read. There's all kinds of things I find very interesting. Just that nobody I know also finds them interesting. But there's a lot of interesting reading about the way the law developed and what the common law originally was. Afterwards, I can give you a reading list if you want for esoteric legal history books that are accessible to people like us. Yes, well, you can tell me now. I just I just purchased this one and started it. I know that book. I have that. I'm embarrassed to say I have that in my bathroom at home. <laughs> so I'm always reading through it. There's a lot of good things in there. The problem is that that's excerpts. It doesn't tell a story. Yeah, yeah. It's the history of the common law, the development of Anglo-American legal institutions. Yeah, if you can read that whole thing, you're better than me because I'm, I have the book. I know the authors. I think it's great. I'm trying to go through it. I'm on like chapter clearly. three. It's it's slow going, but I am really enjoying it. Uh, yeah, it's I, great. I'll, I'll make a recommendation for something that's interesting. It's called The Birth of the Common Law. I'm going to turn around and look at my shelf. Make sure I'm giving you the title right. Sometimes I buy books faster than I read them, and, and that's probably a mistake, but... The Birth of the English Common Law. It's by a Dutch author named Van Tanenen. The Birth of the English Common Law. Okay. That's a wonderful history of the way things got started. Something that's always recommended is a book by Arthur Hogue called The Origins of the Common Law. That's not quite as good. Okay. Yeah, I have that on my shelf. I haven't opened it, but you, if you like the other one better, that's good enough for me. Let me ask you a, some, a series of questions about specific social issues for maybe the skeptically minded or, and, and for myself too, because understanding the basic structure of the common law or of, or of this type of legal systems, you know, there's, there's a conflict, there's someone with a complaint, a plaintiff, there's who is going to accuse someone of something and, and bring a lawsuit. 
Like, I can bring a lawsuit against someone if a statute says I can, but we're talking about the absence of that. And so let's say there has to be some actual conflict or something. Some conflicts seem important, but hard to figure out how they might be handled. But just like markets, I think it's often surprising how creative these evolutionary processes can be. So I'm, I'm open-minded that there are interesting ways. So here's one question. Has tort law or the common law evolved any creative mechanisms for managing crimes against children or other people who are not in full possession of their faculties, such as people with cognitive disabilities? Or And I understand that in normal circumstances, parents and family can be the responsible agents, and that's very normal. But what about more difficult cases where it's the guardians themselves who are abusive or where there are no guardians around or, you know, orphaned children, et cetera. Maybe there's no good solution, but are there any creative solutions that have evolved around this issue? Yeah. So you're asking a good question and a specific question. I might give you a general answer. And if general's good, and if I don't get it back around to the specific question, then tell me again. Okay. Because what you're asking is, how solutions to new problems develop. So I'm going to sort of give you an overview. In the 19th century during the Industrial Revolution, there was a completely new kind of problem. People were manufacturing many things in mass production, and they were small items. So I'll give you an example. So rapid shave was something that cost 69 cents. It was a shaving cream. Rapid shave had some kind of misleading advertising. But what could you do about it? Nobody can sue for 69 cents. There was no way for tort law to handle this kind of potentially fraudulent behavior. But of course, what happened was some of the cleverest people out there are plaintiff's lawyers. They're in the business of figuring out new ways to regulate others so that they can collect a cut. The common law solution to this was something called class action lawsuits. When the Industrial Revolution hit, there was a need for the ability to sue manufacturers who had made many things which only caused, caused a small amount of harm to people, but the, in net, it was a lot of harm. There was no way to sue it. Somebody came up with, let's just combine all of these, courts recognize it, we have the class action lawsuit, which now is one of the primary regulatory devices. So that's a way in which the common law innovates. We get to the 20th century and people can be exposed to chemicals or other toxins that might cause cancer in 20 or 30 years. But that means there's no damage in the present. How can you, you can't sue unless there's a damage. What can the, what can the court law do about that? And again, clever plaintiff's lawyers who are constantly innovating came up with the idea of medical monitoring. If you can show that exposure to a certain chemical or a product gives you an increased risk of cancer, then what you can recover is the medical monitoring during the time period so that you can try to avoid the cancer. For every time there's some kind of new technological development where we don't know how to use the product safely, we have we need the plaintiff's lawyers to figure out ways of solving the problem. My tort students always want to know why so many of the cases in the casebook are about railroads. So I use an old traditional casebook. It's always about railroads. And why is it about railroads? Because at one point in time, railroads were new technology. They were incredibly productive. They were allowing the commercialization of society, but we didn't know how to use them safely. Sparks would cause fire. How could, you know, what it, there were turntables in cities, kids would get hurt. So tort law came up with rules that govern the new technology. More recently, the same thing is going on with what is called new reproductive technologies. We don't know what the rules are about those. Hey, are fertilized embryos property or are they, their lawsuits are teaching us what the rules are there. So for all of the new problems that come along, the effort to try to address them will cause many people to try many things and finally something will work. That's the generality. Getting back to your problem, is there a way of dealing with children who can't protect their own interests? To some extent, the answer is yes, to some extent, that's been addressed because the legal system has something called a guardian ad litem. So the court can appoint someone to represent the interests of a party that can't represent himself or herself. And that guardian ad litem can be appointed for children, appointed for incompetent people, 
but that's probably not a perfect solution. There always will be cases in which people can't protect their own interests. Nobody else is aware of it. What can the common law do about that? I don't know the answer yet. The question is, can you do better by empowering the government to take steps? And concern for children leads to many instances in which children are taken away from their parents for reasons that we probably wouldn't want to see being done. There's too many instances of children being taken away from their parents because they were left in a car or because they were wandering around. The comparison is always, can you do better by having the government step in or by letting the common law evolve? So with regard to the people whose interests are not protected, there is a partial solution that's already come up. Will that continue? One way to stop the common law from teaching us what the ideal solutions are or what the superior solutions are is that have the government step in and make a rule. Government legislation cuts off common law development, and then we're stuck with whatever the rules are. If it's a good rule, we're lucky. If it's not, then we're stuck. And once you, you get entrenched interest, you can almost never change the rules that have been put in through legislation. I'm an advocate of common law, not because it's perfect or ideal. It's never right. But because it's self-correcting, and in the long term, I think it does a better job than empowering anybody to say, I know what the solution is. Here's the best rule that we can use. Yeah, it's controversial, but I assume something like that could have been true with abortion if there hadn't been legislative efforts to preempt rules around that. That's probably an example where the legislature set yeah. rules and stopped common law evolution. If states were not enforcing the rules about abortion, then what would happen is the only lawsuits that would come up would be lawsuits in which some party could show that there was some harm. That would be the kind of thing where Perhaps a husband didn't want there to be an abortion and the woman did and there was a conflict. And some kind of rules that govern the outcome would evolve in that case. The reason why I can't speculate is because abortion has been made criminally illegal in various states before Roe versus Wade. And legislative or criminalization, a criminalization of abortion or drugs or anything else, that becomes the rule. For things like drug offenses, there can't be common law tort rules. There's no such thing as a victimless tort. To have a tort case, somebody has to be injured by somebody else and there's a lawsuit. If I'm hurting myself, there's no lawsuit. There's going to be no regulation of drugs, sex, things like that, as long as there's no victim. I'm kind of libertarian. I would like a society in which there are no victimless crimes, no victimless torts. So I favor that. Other people think that's terrible. We should have ways of protecting people from harming themselves. We need some kind of paternalistic entity. I understand the argument, but the last thing I want is politicians to be the paternalistic entity and be able to make the rules because then we get highly oppressive rules. So yeah. I'm willing to accept the imperfection in a system where you don't get any rules or regulation unless there is a victim that's been harmed. My guess is from partially from reading your book, is that that's true. But at the edges, what counts as a victim or causing an injury, it can be fuzzy in some cases. I mean, there are paradigm yeah. cases where it's super obvious if I punch you in the face or something like. And there are paradigm cases in the other direction like where no court is going to recognize uh, a victim who says, you know, I'm upset because he was reading a book I don't like or something like that. But there are cases where it's pretty ambiguous, like, say, defamation. Defamation is something that seems to have been recommend, recognized in courts. But on some level, it consists of other people talking. It's a form of speech regulation that nevertheless is, is so widely considered important by so many people. Courts seem to see that, like someone telling lies about your character or something in such a way is so injurious to your well-being that even though... You know, I didn't punch you. I didn't steal your physical property. We're going to regard that as a legal injury. So you talk about how John Locke and libertarians paint this perfect, beautiful, like Euclidean picture of self-ownership and property rights. And the common law develops rights that are close to that, but they're kind of fuzzier around the edges. Like it's maybe 90, 95 percent this perfect picture, but with a lot of fuzzy edges. Does that sound right? Oh, yeah. You're comments that went in two directions. So you actually asked about two things. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, they're both things I like talking about. Perhaps my favorite chapter in the book is the chapter on freedom of speech. 
because that shows how you get effective regulation without any government. You talked about defamation. Why is there a tort of defamation where people saying something that's false and damaging to you, you can sue and recover? Why is that the case? Because in the past, juries would recognize that that's the kind of harm that should be compensated. You started out by saying, there's some things that are obviously harm being punched in the face. There are some things that are obviously not harm, like I'm offended by him reading the book. That's just not harm that's recognized by the law yet. But what counts as harm changes with time. The common law evolves with us. So if you go back into the 19th century, harm would be physical injury. But when you get into the 20th century in the United States and England, we have such a secure life. We're so secure from direct physical injury that other interests seem to be important to protect. So at some point, juries start to believe that a harm that should be compensated for is if one person intentionally goes out to cause another person severe emotional distress. Not physical harm, but severe emotional distress. The first cases might be you have a prank call and you call a woman and say that her husband's been killed or you like misuse a dead body. There are just cases that juries decide that this is the kind of thing that's a harm, even though it's not a physical harm, it should be compensated for. And as cases like that come up, a new tort evolves. And in the 20th century, you get the tort of the intentional infliction of emotional distress. And now that's compensable. The development of that tort was cut off by harassment law. But if that had continued to evolve, I suspect, given my observation of my students these days, and what's offensive to them is that the standard for the intentional infliction of emotional distress would be much looser than it was when the tort evolved. You had to do something outrageous to have a tort back then. Now, calling somebody the wrong kind of insulting name might be enough. As our cultural mores and as we become more and more secure, more and more things seem like harms that should be compensated, and the law evolves in that direction. So I'm not sure that it won't be the case that at some time hmm. people will be suing because you're reading an offensive book. We're not there yet, but depending on how ordinary people on juries rule, that's how things will evolve. So why is harm harm? Defamation is an ancient tort. It's because people believe that kind of thing was a harm that should be compensated for. If you intentionally make a false statement that defames another, that damages another reputation, that can be a massive injury to people in business and things like that. And so there are lawsuits that allow you to recover. Besides lawsuits for that, in the chapter on freedom of speech, I say the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law of vision, freedom of speech or of the press. And that has the word no in it. But today, everybody knows that no doesn't really mean no. You can't have no law. Why? Because people could shout fire in a crowded theater and cause a panic. That's the hypothetical that's always brought up from Olive Wendell Holmes. And it's exactly wrong. If you shout fire in a crowded theater and you cause a panic, you can be sued for that kind of speech. You can be sued for speech that's fraud. You can be sued for speech that directly causes harm to somebody else. You can be sued for any kind of speech that is actually harm. You don't need the government to step in and regulate speech. Defamation is one example. Invasion of privacy is another example. There's all kinds of tort suits that will govern this. The First Amendment can be no, because we have a regulatory mechanism in effect. That's the common law of defamation and similar lawsuits. Breach of contract. You breach your contract, you make an agreement to do something, you don't do it. Can you be sued? Yes, even though it's just speech. So the common law regulates our speech so that our speech is free and responsible. The only problem comes when you allow the government to regulate speech, because then you can't advocate communism. Then what, if you say the wrong thing, you can be locked up. Then in the 50s, the communists were being jailed. We don't need government regulation of speech because it already exists in the form of tort law, and defamation is the best example. Example, and I'll even go on it more at length. There's a friend of mine, there's a, besides defamation, there's another tort called false light, where if you hold somebody else up, hold somebody up into a false light, there could be a suit for that. One of my law school classmates is probably the leading defamation First Amendment scholar, Rod Smolin. 
we had him down for a symposium a couple of years ago on freedom of speech. He told a great story of a lawsuit that he covered where, without going into detail, he was representing Richard Simmons, who used to be a fitness guru, who was suing because the National Enquirer or some magazine like that had falsely said he had transitioned from being a man to a woman. And he wanted to sue because this was holding him up into a false light. And they brought a lawsuit and they lost. They lost big time. And the reason why they lost is because the way our mores have evolved is that today the law won't recognize the, someone who transitions from a man to a woman as defamatory, as something that's bad or is, is a negative light. It would be prejudicial. Oh, I see. They won't count that as harm. Our culture is developed in such a way that being accused of transitioning won't be seen as being accused of something bad. And that's new also. I mean, what counts as harm is constantly changing based on what the ordinary person believes in society. You just mentioned breach of contract, and it made me think of another question I had. Something that the people in the modern world are very concerned about is like discrimination, discrimination in the workplace. And it seems to me that is something that has probably also been legislatively cut off. I don't think that every form of discrimination could be a tort under the common law, especially if it's very explicit and you just say, I'm a company and I refuse to hire Mormons or something or whatever. But a lot of forms of discrimination seems to me could conceivably be litigated as breach of contract or false advertising or something like that or sexual harassment. If you hire a woman under the pretense that you're hiring someone for a normal job and then it becomes implicit that you're expecting sexual favors or something like that, it seems to me that could be some form of breach of contract or something like that that the common law could handle without a lot of legislative action. Are there other creative ways that the common law has or could evolve to address some of these issues in ways that don't require legislation? I don't think that the common law would address the most obvious forms of discrimination. Discrimination wouldn't be legally regulated under a common law system. Why? Because in order for there to be a tort, you have to show that somebody's actions have harmed either intentionally or negligently caused you harm. It has to harm you or violate one of your rights. And none of us have any right to be hired by somebody else. In other words, if people want to indulge in racist or sexist or other beliefs and behavior that we think is morally improper, under a common law system, they would be allowed to do so. If a company says we will hire on a completely colorblind or sex-blind basis and then doesn't, that would be misrepresentation. There could be a lawsuit to make misrepresentation. That's what I'm talking about. And I suspect that would be more common than a company openly just saying, we're not going to hire you for racial reasons or whatever. Yeah, but in the past, in the Southern states, people would say, we're not hiring you black people. Yeah, I'm talking about in the modern West, let's say. But would discrimination have been dealt with through the common law? The answer is probably no. If somebody wanted to racially restrict who they would hire or who could come into their hotel, they'd be able to do it because no one has a right to other people's property. Discrimination couldn't have been dealt with effectively through tort law in that way if you'd have to deal with it in a different way. Things like misrepresentation, you know, if people are saying or advertising themselves as being neutral and they're not, that's misrepresentation. If there are contractual agreements of certain types and that's not honored, you could sue up in that case. When I say the common law is not ideal or not perfect, it also is not going to achieve any ideal system of justice. Let's say you believe that the ideal society has no decision-making based on racial animus, sexual animus, ethnic animus, and that's what the ideal society would look like. You're not going to get there through the common law. Common law is not going to get you that kind of ideal justice. All it's going to do is allow people who've been harmed to recover from those who harm them and therefore create more cooperative activity. You're going to have to use other means to convince people not to be racially biased. You're going to have to do that through whatever social means or whatever persuasive means you want to have. With regard to the civil rights movement in the United States, the greatest thing that happened was Brown versus Board of Education, which prevented the government from making racially discriminatory decisions. I'm not a fan of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because that interfered with private people making their own decisions. And the 
long-term effects of trying to correct people's moral internal thinking has given us what I would think is the source of a lot of the identity politics and identitarian type of issues that we have today. Some things have to be dealt through persuasion and evolution and not through law. And it seems that they are largely, that it has been a reliable mechanism changing hearts and minds, as it were. So, I mean, not all, always and everywhere, but that seems I mean, to be the like arc. Sa- same-sex marriage probably is an example. The culture changed before the law in that case. Yeah. When people are entertained acceptable, the law changed. I believe that with regard to most of the racial and sexual issues, that's also true. I'm much older than you, so I remember the 1970s, where all of a sudden there's a vast influx of women into law school, which used to be all male, because the culture had changed. They wanted to be professionals. That's what was responsible for the change, much more than anything that had to do with the law. Once the culture changes, the law usually follows. Yeah, I think you can see that in like, you know, general social survey questions that they've asked for decades or something. It's imperfect, but you see pretty steady lines on attitudes about like, would be upset if your son or daughter married someone of another race yeah. or if your neighbor was another race or something like that. Just people just used yeah. to say, yeah, I'd be upset. And now they barely do. Now they're upset if your Democrat who marries a Republican or a Republican who <laughs> marries a Democrat. But I just want to be clear. I am an advocate for common law regulation, but common common law is not a panacea. It's not a panacea. It can address different types of harm. It's probably an ineffective tool for addressing private discrimination. Here's a couple more, not that I'm really concerned about, but just some things that surprised me. You mentioned at some point in the book that at least maybe copyright or some forms of intellectual property had evolved in the common law. Can you say more about that? That surprised me for just the reasons you're talking about, how easy it would be to come and claim that you were a victim of somebody else printing on their own printing press or something. I'm stepping outside my expertise a little bit on this because I don't do this, but copyright was common law. Patents are not. Patents is created by the Constitution. That was government created. But at copyright, you had common law copyright. If you produce something, and you didn't publish it, other people couldn't take it and use it. If they did, you could sue them. So it was common law copyright. That's where it started once we got the Constitution in the United States going that not only created patents, but we had copyright laws. So the copyright laws are constantly updated, which supplanted what common law copyright is. That's how Disney managed to get Mickey Mouse to last like 100 years. 10 years yeah, because they kept ended. on changing the statute that would extend it. But yeah, copyright is something that evolved, the common law patent didn't. And that may mean that maybe patents of some sort would have evolved. I don't particularly see how. Because a patent means if you think of something, nobody else can think of it themselves. Copyright means if you make something, nobody else can take your copy. But if they dream it up themselves, they can use it. Yeah, patent seems less defensible in the sense that simultaneous invention is fairly common. These ideas are often in the air, whereas it's strange credulity to think that two people might write the same novel, you know? It might be that a novel about asteroid impacts or a movie about asteroid impacts, Deep Impact Armageddon is in the air, so two studios make a similar movie, but you're not going to have the same exact script. You've got me outside my realm of expertise, but (laughs) trademark and copyright are common law. Patents are statutory and Trademark makes sense because I could see that as a consumer, you might sue someone for fraud. You're like, they said this was a Gucci bag, but it's not. I'm not sure how, as the manufacturer, you would bring a tort. It seems to me that the victim in a case of trademark would be the consumer who was defrauded out of buying a, a good that they thought was made by one company rather than another or something. Is that how it came about? You're asking the good questions you're going to make me confess. <laughs> I teach the basic torts course at Georgetown. I love doing it. That's the most fun I have. I love the course, but it's the basic course. In the old days, which means when I went to law school, torts used to be an entire first year course. So it would be intentional torts, negligence, liability, and then nuisance, defamation, and different kinds. And you do the whole thing. These days, it's only a three credit course. There's all kinds of wonderful areas in tort law that have answers to your questions 
but because I haven't done them since the 1970s, <laughs> I don't remember the answers well enough. But yeah, there's fascinating suits for when you can sue for business inter interference and when you can sue, like you used to be able to sue for violation of a promise to marry. You can't really do that anymore. But when there are issues where some people's actions cause harm to others, even if it's not physical harm, and suits have evolved or juries have believed there should be compensation, then you get regulation. You can do whatever you want to with your property. But if you build your house in such a way that you block my beautiful view of the ocean, that could be a nuisance. Maybe you're not allowed to do that. How do we know what the rules are? They develop over time through the common law process. My understanding just from reading Brian Kaplan's latest book, and I interviewed him about Build Baby Build, is that up until the time in, I forget the city that passed some law that basically treated building condos as a nuisance or something, that the common law had never accepted those kinds of lawsuits as legitimate that you had to, you know, if you were pouring smoke into my yard or, or whatever, noxious odors or noise or something, those could be nuisance suits, but they never regarded blocking my light or just being a building that was ugly as a nuisance. And then a city passed, you know, legislatively created that and higher courts basically validated it. So it seems yeah. to be a creature of legislation. I'm always opposed to legislation because legislation always favors whatever special interest has proposed it. The nuisance suit is if you do something that interferes with my quiet enjoyment of my property, that can be a nuisance. What exactly that is, it is sewage, foul odors, things like that. Under certain circumstances, it can be also blocking a view under the right circumstances. It will depend on the case and the situation. Like but, if you opened up a, a lighthouse or an observatory or something like that and someone blocked your telescope view, maybe? Again, I'm outside my expertise, <laughs> but when property rights interfere with each other in certain ways, sometimes there can be compensation, sometimes they can't. One more specific question about torts has just occurred to me. David Friedman talks frequently about when, because he wrote so much about medieval Iceland and, you know, they had their own legal system, not a common law system, but I'm sure there's plenty, plenty of overlap. It's a customary system of dispute resolution that evolved a very elaborate sets of rules and transferable tort claims, or maybe even in some cases being able to just like homestead and abandoned tort claims seem to be a feature of that legal system. Did anything like that? Well, I guess there's like contingency fees, so that's similar, but were there similar developments in English common law? I like David Friedman's work, and I love when he does Icelandic sagas and things like that. And Iceland is an interesting example of a non-governmental way of creating rules. But Iceland is one thing. British common law is another. The common law is, as I think I said earlier, to some extent, an historical accident in different countries and different places the rules will evolve in different cultures or in different ways. They won't necessarily be the same rules. Ron Fuller is a legal philosopher who talked a lot about customary law. And what he points out is the rules of customary law are not the ideal or most rational rules. After the fact, you could probably think of better rules than the ones that developed. But the ones that developed are the ones that allowed people to cooperate. And once everybody knew what they were and they could cooperate, that allows social progress, that allows prosperity. So they're not the ideal or the perfect rules, they're just ones that allow people to work together. And in different places, they can be entirely different. So I don't know that there's anything about the way Iceland developed that's common to the way the British system developed because there were different things going on. I do know that over time, the British common law court system is come up with brilliant solutions to the biggest problem. But in today's society, the biggest problem is corporations have large amounts of money and they can hire the best lawyers. And injured consumers usually have no money. So what can they possibly do? But look at our tort system. Our tort system is poor man's law. If you're a destitute person who's been injured, every plaintiff's lawyer wants you because of the way they make their money. By allowing lawyers to recover on a contingency fee basis, it guarantees that everybody has a lawyer. And one of the jokes that I used to make, I can't anymore, there used to be a lot of commercials in the past. People used to watch TV. 
My kids don't. But in the past, people used to watch commercial TV. And there was a series of commercials that would come on at night. It was for the law firm Science and Kirk. It was, if you have a phone, you have a lawyer, call Science and Kirk, which means if you're injured, we'll take your case. Because it's the internet age now, that company still exists. I looked it up. Now the catchphrase is just you have a lawyer. They got rid of the phone point. But you can drive anywhere throughout the country and see large billboards. I drove in today, one of the Washington DC buses. The whole side of the bus was a picture of a lawyer with the word injured on it. Call this number. There's an entire industry of people trying to help poor people recover against the rich and corporations. That's a wonderful system. You know, if there's no other, you know, poor people can always get into court under the tort system. That's something that evolved. The contingency fee deals with that. Class actions are a way of dealing with things. I'm glad because that's it. That's very interesting. The way things work now, besides getting contingency fee, let's say that you get a judgment against a corporation for $100,000, but you need the money. And the corporation might appeal, it could take years. What are you going to do? What good is a judgment if it's going to be a 70 years old, you need the money? This could be in the courts for five or six years. But what good is this judgment? Then today you have commercials on TV. I don't know if you've seen that. Nobody watches TV. But have you heard of J.G. Wentworth? Uh, yeah. Familiar. Yeah, really horrible commercials of people on buses singing opera. And what they're singing about is, we'll buy your judgment. So you got a $100,000 judgment. We'll give you $60,000 now, take the money, and then it'll be our job to collect $100,000 over time. There are companies which buy and sell judgments and not only judgments, other things like that. If you're a lottery winner, you can do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Can you transfer tort claims? To some extent, that's restricted. But legislatively, to some extent, it's restricted by the canon of ethics. But these days, like one problem is can somebody fund another person's tort suit? That used to be champ, that used to be illegal. But that's being liberalized as well. You don't need as much funding for other people's tort suits as long as you have a contingency fee. But under certain circumstances, the question is, could people get together and say, we want to push this case here, we'll put money in and, and get a plaintiff to do it. That is something that's a possibility. There's restrictions on that under the town of ethics though. How do you think in the absence of government, because you can imagine this common law system with government courts and everything, but you're also in the last chapters advocate that's not necessary and that may be an impediment to, you know, it makes the courts probably less competitive. How do you think judges would be selected outside of government courts just by reputation or are there historical precedents that we can look to to see how judges might be selected or identified? I think so, but in the book, the first half of the book is about common law as a regulatory mechanism. And then I try to apply it to two problems. So I apply it to the question of natural rights and I apply it to the question of freedom of speech. And then the last part of the book, I get a little radical and I suggest that you can move a long way in the direction of amity. So we're entering that part of the book now. I say that as a preface because you said, how would judges be selected? And I think that in many cases, judges wouldn't be selected and the way of solving problems wouldn't be clashes between two parties with third party decision makers. You go far enough back in time, very few people who have important interests want to roll the dice and put the decision in the hands of a third party. So most of the time, we'd like to negotiate or mediate a settlement. And I believe there would be a lot more of that. So an illustration of that was I believe it was in the 1990s, the courts in California had become so crowded with cases that it took forever for people to get into court. And basically, the ability to resolve things through litigation was valuable because it was taking so long. And at the time, the California legislature required mandatory mediation before you could go to trial. So you had to try to mediate. It was mandatory before you went to trial. And what they found was when there was mediation, 80% of the cases didn't go to trial because people would rather come to a decision themselves where they have some control. It doesn't always work, but I'd rather come to an agreement 
you know, come to an agreement, there's no appeal, things are settled, you decide that you restore cooperation through means that don't require a third party decision maker. There will be some cases that don't work like that. There will be some situations in which courts really are the best way to settle anything. If it's disputes between big businesses, they're not going to want to go to court. They're not going to want judges. They will have contractual matters and contractual ways of resolving these things. A business example is their business is global. So there's a lot of contracts between businesses in different countries. What happens if they get into a contract dispute or a trade dispute? How can that be settled? An interesting thing is that many of the international companies will write into their contracts that if a dispute arises, it will be settled in the commercial court in London, which is a government court. And why? And the reason was because the commercial court in London developed the reputation of having judges who were sophisticated, understood the sophisticated standards of business. They would come to quick decisions. They would resolve cases in a sophisticated way quickly. It was a better product. And so the companies just wrote that into their contracts and it went there. So that's one example. But there will be cases in which there's courts and judges will have to be chosen. It's hard to generalize. In the, a good way of finding out how things work is by looking at places where you didn't have access to government services in the past. So one example of that is Black communities in the segregated South. David Bader's an historian who's written a lot about this kind of thing. Another example is Jewish communities in Poland between World War I and World War II. Like there was so much anti-Semitism there. There was no way the government was going to protect the Jews. There was no way the white government was going to protect Black communities. And so you look at that and you see what happened. How did they develop rules? And they developed oh, this interesting historical stories about how without access to government services, they can develop the kind of enforcement mechanisms and rules they need in order to cooperate, even though they're cut off from what would normally be government services. And often, it's not that they pick judges and have disputes. Sometimes it's just cultural. If you're a part of a feminist community, maybe you have one way of settling things. If you're part of a survivalist community, you might have different ways of settling disputes. One side might say, let's have duels. The other side might say, let's have a group hug. I can't tell you the way it will come out. In my community, where I live, we have a listserv where people at night walk around with little vests on because they're the community watch people. And then they go on their listserv and they call each other names because they're Democrats or Republicans and things like that. But the variety of ways in which these kind of things will evolve depends on the time, the culture, the beliefs, the group, and the size of the institution. Do you have any recommendations for books that complement this book especially well? That's an interesting question that I haven't thought about. The answer might be no, that I don't have recommendations. And or an author. Yeah, the reason why maybe I'm just not well read enough to give you a good answer. But most of what I do has come about from looking at the past and looking at legal history and seeing the way things were in the past and not participating in the sort of political science paradigm of government versus market. So since most of the writing is government versus market, and I'm working in another paradigm, I don't find too many other books like the one I wrote. There's lots of books about the common law and history and how it evolves. It's all interesting stuff. I stumbled into it myself when I was writing a dissertation. My dissertation was about criminal law. And before I wrote it, I decided maybe I should know something about the history of the criminal law. And when I discovered the history of the criminal law, I realized there's all kinds of things about the way the law works that I don't understand. So I'm extracting from history certain beliefs and trying to put them into the present. But I'm not aware right now of anybody else who's doing that. There are a lot of economists who will talk about the efficiency of the common law and how the common law actually gives us more efficient rules than statutes. I think that's interesting and useful, but it's not what I'm doing. What about Tom Tom Bell's work? Yeah, if you want to read people, Tom Bell's work is good. Todd Zawicki's work is good because Tom will write about polycentric law and he'll look into these kind of things. Who else does this? David Friedman's stuff is interesting. There's just not too many people who are focusing on the common law the way I am. 
Sure, sure. Honestly, I can't say how much I enjoyed this book. And by the time this episode is released, it will be available on Amazon or anywhere you want to buy it. It's not out currently, but it will be out when you are listening to this, fair reader. Are you working on anything right now outside of this book? Yes, if we're employed as professors, it's mandatory that we're always working on something. <laughs> so the answer is yes. Officially. Right now, actually, I'm working on a chapter that could be a chapter in a second edition of this book. But actually, what I'm putting together is a second book that's going to be called Questioning Assumptions. And it's about six or seven chapters that look at current political argumentations and suggest that it's based on faulty assumptions and we should just reconsider the way things are thought about. So to, for an example, I have one of them where I think the basic blocking argument for the state, for the government, is misrepresented. But Fox's argument is, in the state of nature, you have all these inconveniences, like no objective judges and no enforcement mechanism and you know, nobody to make the rules and you can't be partial in your own case. And so what follows from that is, you need the government to come in and provide these essential services, and that's the state, and then this is an argument for a small state. That's like Locke's argument. Everybody repeats it over and over again. But it's wrong. If, in the state of nature, you don't have those things, that might prove that a government has to make sure that these services are provided. It doesn't prove that the government has to provide the services itself. And so people just overlook the basic thing that maybe the only role for the government is to make sure that the services are provided by private people in a safe way, not to provide it themselves. Think about public schools. If you believe everybody should be entitled to an education, that might mean that the government should make sure everybody can go to school. It doesn't prove that the government should provide schools. So there's about six chapters that question fundamental assumptions like that and are designed to reconceive some of our problems. It reminds me of an essay Roderick Long wrote about John Locke's argument for government there. I think his point was that John Locke jumps from the claim that disputes need a third party to the claim that there is some third party that should mediate all disputes, rather than that it could be multiple third parties. Yeah. I agree with Rod. Of course, we got to give Locke a break. He's <laughs> writing in the 17th century, and he's pretty liberal for that time period. And where can people find you if they want to keep up with your ongoing projects? I have a website associated with my position at Georgetown. Anytime I publish anything, I put it up there. So it's like a way of getting all my writings cheaper. And you can download it. The easiest way to find me is that my last name is H-A-S-N-A-S. And nobody in North America, there's nobody in North America with that last name that's not related to me. And my relatives won't come up on me. Google search. Oh, perfect. So Asnes will probably lead you to my website. It's actually hard to find because if you use my name, it goes to a Georgetown website, which is like Georgetown 360 that the university puts up. And then you have to find your way quick through to my personal website. But all my articles and things are up there, including a lot of smarmy op-eds I've put out in the past. This just reminded me of another book I'll recommend because it's where I first encountered your work, which is Ed Stringham's collection, Anarchy and the Law. I think you're included in the myth of the rule of law. Is that the essay that you're yes. in that book? Yeah. Anyway, I loved that. It's a giant tome collection of essays, but right. John's work is in there as well. The myth of the rule of law will be incorporated into my next book. That'll be in there. You bet. Transformative essay. Everyone should read that. My guest today, once again, is John Hasness, and his book is Common Law Liberalism, A New Theory of the Libertarian Society. John, thank you so much for joining me on Ideas Having Sex. Uh, thanks so much. This has been a pleasure and a great deal of fun. Thank you for listening to Ideas Having Sex, where we have stimulating conversations on social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you're a fan of what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. I'm Chris Kaufman. Thanks for listening.